And now on for a detailed look at Soviet strategy and the prospects for war and peace. How does the new regime in the Soviet Union view the East-West nuclear debate? We present War and Peace, the view from Moscow. Lenin's tomb in Red Square, a ritual still going strong 60 years after his death, in which ordinary Russians come from miles around to pay homage to the remains, if not these days to all the ideals, of the founder of the Soviet state. Two of his successors, Leonid Brezhnev and Yuri Andropov, have died in rapid succession. They lie in rather less splendid graves behind the mausoleum. The flowers on Andropov's grave are still fresh because he died only weeks ago at a time of maximum danger in relations between the Soviet Union and the West with arms control talks on both strategic and intermediate range missiles broken off. How will the new regime handle this crisis? Do they really want peace and on what terms? We have come to Moscow to find out the answers to this and other questions from two of the men who shaped the policies of the Soviet superpower, and in so doing, helped to shape the destinies of all the people on Earth. We should be talking to Vadim Zagladin, who is first deputy head of the International Department of the Soviet Central Committee, and as such, a powerful voice in the formulation of Soviet foreign policy. We shall also be meeting General Viktor Starodubov, a member of the Soviet General Staff, an expert on nuclear weapons, who took part in the arms control talks in Geneva. To question them, we have brought John Ericsson, Professor of Defence Studies at Edinburgh University, an expert on the Red Army, and Lawrence Friedman, Professor of War Studies at King's College London, a specialist in global strategy. General Starodubov, you're a member of the Soviet General Staff. I'd like to start by asking you the same question I recently put to the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, General Bernard Rogers, the man with a finger on the button on the NATO side. Has the threat of nuclear war come closer in recent months? And how seriously do you rate that danger? I think that the fact that the military are appearing more often on your uh, on television screens that fact speaks for, the, uh, for itself it shows that the world public is anxious your people is anxious our people they're worried about the situation that is evolving in the world you use the expression that the finger of General Rogers has come closer to the nuclear button. You notice that cor uh, correctly. That figure has come closer after the deployment of American 
missiles in Europe. These missiles have basically changed the strategic situation after the deployment of the new American missiles, the situation has changed for the worse. The situation has taken on a very dangerous turn. If I were to answer you briefly, I would say this, that the situation has changed, unfortunately, for the worse. Well, could I just ask Mr. Zagladin on this point? People in the West are puzzled that you should have broken off talks at the time of maximum danger. When the United States continued with the talks while your own SS-20s were being deployed. There's a substantial difference between our missiles and the American ones. Our missiles were sighted in uh, to replace older ones. This didn't signify a change of our intentions or policy. Whereas the American missiles did change the general strategic situation. The negotiations we were conducted had the aim of securing a substantial cut in the arms in Europe. We understood that the Europeans wanted to achieve a reduction of Soviet missiles. Nevertheless, the missiles did appear, the American missiles, and this means that this cancelled out the meaning of the negotiations as we understood it. Instead of achieving a cut in arms, we had to, while continuing the talks, we had to thereby sanction an increase in American missiles. This would have been a deception. That's why we undoubtedly uh, would have been prepared to continue the talks if the missiles had not been deployed. But since the American missiles did appear, the talks simply became pointless. I don't understand quite what sort of change in the strategic situation these new missiles involved. If it was simply a case of extra missiles to tilt some balance, then, as I'm sure you're aware, the number of Soviet warheads facing NATO has increased while we have been talking to you. And anyway, the number of missiles coming in is really quite small so far. Uh, is there something, is it that the problem, or is there something special about these missiles that you find particularly un, uh, unpleasant and undesirable? There are two aspects to this question. First, the deployment of the missiles continued during the talks. Before the, we proposed a moratorium on both sides for the duration of the talks pending an agreement. What's more, we said that if the moratorium were agreed upon, we would unilaterally reduce our missiles. Following this, we did, for a time, continue the deployment, but since September 1982, we have not been deploying missiles. These are just the facts. As for the main aspect of the matter, how the situation, the strategic situation changed, this is very simple. The American missiles reached the territory of the Soviet Union, and we agreed with the United States that missiles would be strategic if they reached the territory of the other country. We agreed that their range would exceed 5,000 meters, 5,000 kilometers. The American missiles in Europe reached the territory of the Soviet Union, and in this sense, they radically changed the situation. What you seem to be saying, and incidentally, the, the Americans have not accepted your definition of a strategic missile. They have uh, had a, a range limitation uh, which would uh, be above the range of the cruise and Pershing missiles. But aside from that, what you seem to be saying is that missiles move into a higher class of significance if they can hit the territory of a superpower. 
but missiles that can hit Western Europeans or Eastern Europeans are in some way less important, less strategically significant. Surely this is rather uh, objectionable to both Western Europeans and, for that matter, Eastern Europeans. Besides the fact that they're very exact, they can strike, they can pinpoint a target at a great distance, have a great range, but the main thing is that they have placed the world a few minutes away from the launching site. Placed our country a few minutes away. You know that we have hotlines between our two countries, which allow to for forestall an accident. But how can you warn? How can anybody warn us if a, if a missile is launched in Europe against the Soviet Union? The time in flight is very small indeed. This makes it a first strike weapon. And as has been said more and more nowadays, this is a weapon which we call can behead the opponent. They are deployed in Europe in order to disorganize our defenses at the initial stage of the war. This is a very dangerous weapon. The other side has to take all this into consideration. That is why when we talk about measures which we take in answer to the deployment, we have to take adequate measures Uh, in answer to this new situation which these uh, American missiles have given rise to in Europe. I'd like to bring in John Erickson at this point because um, you've been coming to this country for 30 years now. I mean, do you feel that the situation between Western Europe and, the, and particularly between the United States and the Soviet Union is as bad now as you can remember it? Or do you see some more positive signs in the situation? No, I think it's a very serious situation indeed. And I certainly accept the... Um, the problem of the missile crisis. But I think what, uh, what I would like to ask of my Soviet uh, colleagues, and I think what people in general would like to ask is this, uh, how do you see the future? What is it like? Are you pessimistic? Are you reasonably optimistic? How far do you see? What do you plan? These, I think, is what we'd like to ask of you, if it's at all possible to, uh, to put these questions. But the first thing I think we want to know from you, what do you want? Mr. Erickson is capable of posing his questions very well. They are brief, but they require a serious answer. The first question, I would say, requires... lends itself to two answers, a maximum answer and a minimum. As far as a maximum is concerned, we would like the same thing for our security that others want. We want the threat of war to recede. We want a nuclear-free Europe. We, we want the abolition of nuclear weapons in general, if possible. But that, of course, is, is in the remote future. Speaking of the situation today, we consider that our security requires uh, and we stand on, we stand for the principle of sufficient security. We think this requires weapons capable of defending our country, of uh, repulsing a threat uh, posed by weapons that others have. I understand, uh, Professor Erickson, what is behind your question. It is sometimes said that the Soviet Union would like to be as strong as all the other countries jointly. This is not so. We concern ourselves with our problems only, with what is targeted on us. We are concerned with what threatens us. Could we obviously uh, hope to find out some of the ways in which the situation can be improved because I'm sure this is what most people are anxious about at the moment. Let us start with the 
central talks on nuclear arms. You've stated, as far as I understand, um, in the past, that it is a precondition for the resumption of these talks that we go back to the situation as it was in December 1983, before the new American missiles arrived. Now, as uh, it is reasonably clear, as I'm sure your own political analysts tell you, that these missiles are not going to be removed on that basis, does that mean that you see no opportunity for resuming these talks? Mr. Friedman, I would say this. What are earnest negotiations? We were and are ready to discuss any conditions, but with the obvious purpose, one, of seeking a solution of the problem, in this case, a reduction of nuclear arms in Europe. Two, conducting negotiations honestly and not with a mailed fist behind you. By deploying the missiles in Europe, the United States actually cancelled the principle of the talks. It began doing something before the talks were completed. This approach in itself, apart from everything else, rules out any possibility of earnest talks. And that is why such a dialogue is something we cannot take part in. But, I repeat, we are prepared to negotiate. We don't have to be urged to negotiate. We have our proposals on missiles, on other problems. But these must be earnest negotiations. And that's why it's not a question of seeking a formula, as I see it just now, but of somehow changing the position of the United States. I refer here to the the principle of their approach. The United States must conduct talks not by diktat, not by the principle of trying to impose its decisions by force, but by a normal procedure of negotiations. As you know, the American administration has recently uh, offered dialogue with the Soviet Union. You seem to be saying that uh, this is not good enough. We don't believe you because of the things that you've done in the past. What we need is an earnest of your good intentions. Now, in this context, the missiles themselves can be seen as merely symptoms of a general problem that you face uh, and can perhaps be put to, to one side. Otherwise, you have two possibilities. One, that there is a change of American leadership at the end of this year, uh, and maybe you're waiting for that. Secondly, there are other negotiations going on, on mutual force reductions and uh, the Stockholm talks. Is, it, is one interpretation of what you're saying that if progress is made in these negotiations, uh, and if the Americans uh, follow up their recent change of rhetoric uh, with concrete actions, that that could create the climate in which it will be possible once again to talk about nuclear arms? You say, uh, you began, Mr. Friedman, by saying that the Americans have made a proposal to resume the talks. Yes, on January 16th, Mr. Reagan did make such a proposal. And we immediately said that we note a certain change of tone although following that there have been all kinds of statements. But let us leave that aside for the present. That change of tone was verbal, not backed up by any specific considerations or facts. Turning to con concrete things, they look very differently. Take this. Following January 16th, much later, just a few days ago, ABC television in the United States reported that on October 1st, a new procedure, a new operational procedure was introduced in the United States whereby an exact list of targets in the Soviet Union was adopted. This uh, target list is updated every week and the president carries a, a briefcase with him, yes, of 40,000 targets. Now, that, that is not rhetoric. Secondly, 
General, you have a target list of the United States. That's not the point, do we have a list or don't we? You began by saying that the Americans suggest talks and that the Russians do not want to talk. That is not so. What are we being offered? We're being offered to start negotiations, but here we're being warned that the American position will not change. Why were the uh, talks broken up? I think the American position is changing, but, uh, but in a different direction. They began the, the deployment of the rockets. Uh, stop the talks. Now, there are reports that there has been an agreement with Turkey on deploying missiles there. So, the change has been in the direction of worse. You have to for the worse. take the whole situation into account. Who has what targets in their portfolio? They, they have, you have no doubt that as soon as the new American missiles appeared in Europe, uh, we on our maps had little crosses marked. If, from what I gathered from what the general said earlier, uh, he seemed to be far more worried about Pershing missiles than about cruise missiles, which have none of the qualities that he mentioned. Could he imagine the Soviet general staff accepting a future deal in which some cruise missiles remained on the American side, but Pershing missiles uh, were abandoned and taken back? These missiles, which you, which you placed one grade lower than the Pershing II, I mean the cruise missiles, they're not as innocent as you think. You may not know this, but let me tell you that this is a very dangerous weapon, I mean the cruise missiles. They're very accurate. They have an ability to bypass the anti-aircraft defenses of another country. It also has the a provocative character. The Americans have said many times that they intend to have, you know how many they want to have? 12, 14,000 such cruise missiles, various types and various forms of basing. Some will be nuclear, others will be non-nuclear. How are we to know which are targeted at the Soviet Union and targeted at important targets in our country? This is a very provocative weapon. We're against it, and we're against this weapon being in Europe. This is one of those before and after commercials. <laughs> because before, after you drank a Diet Cola, you got an aftertaste. After. But Diet Pepsi, unlike before, has that new sweetener, which cuts out the aftertaste. After. So, new Diet Pepsi tastes nicer than before. Because unlike before, there's no after. <laughs> new, great-tasting Diet Pepsi. Unlike before, there's no after. <laughs> When you need a little lift, but you just can't take a break, chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The cool, refreshing feeling of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum puts a little lift in everything you do. That good, smooth chewing, that crisp, clean taste, that Wrigley's Spearmint Pickup is going for you. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum really keeps you buzzing. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum keeps you buzzing along. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum really keeps you buzzing. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum keeps you buzzing.
take a different look at life. Take punch. Speaking as Europeans, we view with growing alarm the failure of the Americans and the Soviet Union to understand each other or to talk to each other. And it seems to us from where we are in Europe that we can see some of these obstacles to understanding and can try to illuminate them. Now let me give you an example of the sort of thing that worries people in the West about what you're saying and which is not covered in your analysis. Um, we can understand from your history, your geography, your legitimate security needs, but there are other factors affecting your policy. And these are the factors of ideology. Uh, you, your, your society, you believe in world revolution. This brings an unpredictable quality into your behavior in international affairs, as it did, say, in Afghanistan, as we think it did over the shooting down of the Korean airliner. These are the sort of things that worry people in the West when they're negotiating with you, and that these matters can't simply <coughs> be discussed in terms of numbers. We expected that you would add Grenada to this. As far as ideology is concerned, you're right. We have our concepts concerning social development, its laws, its directions. You have your opinions. But we're not forcing our views on you. We consider that everyone should be free to believe whatever he believes in. If he himself accepts a different view, that's different. But we will not force anyone to accept our views. We consider, however, that this should not affect relations between states. And there have been periods when this was so. It didn't affect our work together. It didn't affect even our comradeship in arms during the war. Yuri Andropov said once last year that we are against transferring ideology into foreign policy. This is the principle we continue to abide by. We abided by it in the past, we abide by it now. As for your mention of Afghanistan, you see, Afghanistan is not an, an example of our forcing our views on anyone. We are helping a friendly government there. I know you disagree with this, but uh, this would take us far afield if we were to argue about it. And there are no other cases of our trying to force our views on anyone. That is something we don't do. While I accept all the arguments about the missiles and the ide ideology and so on, I think it's very important to say there'll be many, many mothers and fathers watching this program, at least I hope so, and sons and daughters. And it's important about figures and attitudes and so on. But I think this opportunity is so unique and so very important, since we have two extremely uh, singular and authoritative people here, to ask the kind of question one wants to ask, actually. What do you really think the future is going to look like? For example, you, Professor Zagladin, have written major works on, on globalistica, on, on the development of Soviet policy. What do you think it, what, what would you tell us that you think it's going to be like, given a fair chance? That's what we want to hear. And above all, how do you think it's going to develop? And this key question, of course, uh, which always puzzles people in the West, is ideology a barrier to, to progress or to coexistence? What is coexistence? What are these things? I mean, ordinary questions for ordinary people. Let me start from the end. Ideology is no obstacle to progress. If we accept the principle that everyone can follow his views, unless he changes them himself, we thereby remove the obstacle. And this is the principle. We set down with Britain, with the United States, with France, in joint documents. Let's follow this principle. That's the first point. Second, you ask about my personal view of the future. It's very simple. If we follow the same road we have been following just now, if there are negotiations merely to 
serve as a cover for a new spiral of the arms race, that will lead us to disaster. We propose a different road, following the road of seeking real solutions to real problems, most important of all to the problem of nuclear disarmament. But doing this honestly... I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but it is important uh, for um, a Western audience to come back to you on some of these points, because we look forward from our vantage point in Europe to a stable relationship between the superpowers. And we have seen the advance of the Soviet Union to superpower status during the 1970s. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Because the areas of regional conflict around the world yeah. are the, the potential source of world wars, more likely than just miscalculations between the two superpowers. And if you use these occasions purely to destabilize local situations, and you accuse the United States of doing the same, this does not result from a mature relationship between the superpowers. Now, is it possible for us to envisage, for our children to envisage, such a mature, balanced, stable relationship between the superpowers that you can work together to find constructive solutions to these problems? Or are you, in fact, going to be shut off forever by your ideological conflict and deep distrust of each other? Uh, Mr. Trefford, I am sure there is such a possibility. But every opportunity, as the philosophers say, has to be translated into a reality. That cannot be done at the expense of one country or by the efforts of one country alone. It requires joint efforts and deeds, not words. You say that the two superpowers have a complex relationship aggravated by various peripheral conflicts and so on. I think you're right, but one thing has to be added there. Peripheral conflicts, uh, to which uh, people often refer, these are actually not a cause, but an effect of a certain policy. And the most important thing of all is trying to change that policy. Can I um, deal with this question, perhaps, of, of ideology? Um, Two questions arise in terms of these principles that you've laid out, to which we can, I'm sure, both agree. Um, the first question, in, in an area of specific political difference between East and West, do the principle, the, does the principle that uh, countries should be free to develop uh, in whatever way they like apply to the countries of Eastern Europe? That's my first question. The second question is, it would seem to me... Maybe please, I don't... Uh, Sorry, are the countries of Eastern Europe uh, able to develop I in whatever way they choose? And the second question, um, it seems to me that you must, uh, as socialists, prefer some factions, some countries to do better in the world than others. Does it worry you, uh, looking at uh, Africa at the moment, that Mozambique and, and possibly soon Angola are being forced into deals with South Africa that you, as possible benefactors, don't seem able to help them get out of? Two rather different questions, but, but I think they're both related. I think related. the East European question is important well, because I think many of our viewers tonight will have been taken by what you said about the Soviet Union not interfering in other countries, whereas as we look at it from where we are, this looks like a prime case of interference. As far as free development of nations is concerned, we are definitely in favor of this. And, and uh, you're wrong in asking me about Eastern Europe. You should ask them that question and they would give you a reply. It's not we who brought socialism to them. They opted for it themselves. And look at those countries. They're all very different. Each is living its own life. And if they weren't free, they wouldn't be living such different lives. Yes, socialism is something common to them all. I know this is distasteful to you, but we like it. We consider they've made a good choice. And by the way, the fact that all those countries which were, in 1945, destroyed and poverty-stricken, the fact that they are all affluent, even even the most backward have gone far ahead. That fact in itself speaks of the correctness of that choice. But I repeat, this is a question that should be addressed to them. We force no views on them. 
We cooperate with them, that's all. Together, we work out certain principles of joint actions, joint political actions, but each country retains its policy, its internal policies, its foreign policy. As far as the second part of your question is concerned, you know, history can be analyzed mm, in great detail from different angles. There are all kinds of facts that determine its course. Evidently, this would also lead us very far afield. All kinds of examples could be cited. But this is not really the subject of our discussion here today. If we were to quote examples here for American television, uh, your viewers may not like it. No, I think what we are concerned with, though, is examining the obstacles to understanding right. between East and West. And I think the points that are being raised here um, are to give you our impression of why it is that your arguments on these fundamental strategic matters are not always accepted as, as you would like them to be. Just as your arguments are not always accepted on our side, I think it's not just a question of ideology. It's a question of approach to the problem of uh, different ideologies. We accept, yes, that our ideologies are, are different. We have no intention of changing ours. You probably have no intention of changing yours. That means we must live on that assumption that our ideologies are different. Otherwise, as Lenin said, someone would have to fly to the moon, and neither you nor we are prepared to do that. Yes, differences exist in ideologies. Let each side we maintain, uh, sort out its problems itself, and uh, the course of history will show uh, which side did better, which side managed, managed better. There's plenty of time if there'll be no nuclear war. Another approach, I will give no names here, but you know those names. There are some people who say that socialism must be wiped out. Its place is on the ash heap of history. It is a focus of evil, and so on. In other words, this is not just a recognition of differences. This is a different approach. Socialism must be abolished. This is not new. You've obviously disliked the rhetoric that's come from the American administration, and we understand that. And indeed, I think many in the administration recognize this may have gone too far. But you're not telling us that the Soviet Union uh, in its own statements, in its own rhetoric, doesn't have things to say about the quality of the Western system, about uh, a critique of the Western system. Didn't uh, Mr. Khrushchev say 20 years ago that he would bury us, they would bury us? Not, I know, in terms of nuclear rubble, but in terms of uh, economic mm -hmm. development and the competition between our ideologies. Uh, you, you must have more confidence in your own ideology uh, not to see it as the basis for the same sort of thoroughgoing critique of capitalism, uh, which is, after all, what Marxists were supposed to do, uh, that uh, you accuse the Americans of making of you. First of all, we advocate our ideology more than criticize the ideology of others. But we do, yes, we do engage in such a critique, a critique of ideology, mind you. We publish a great deal of literature that is of a polemical nature, polemical with, uh, a polemic with British views too, but this criticism is never uh, accompanied by calls to uh, consign to the ash heap of history. To bury, yes, that was an unfortunate statement, but that is not our approach. Whether we like it or not, we know that we have to live together. But that was the essence of détente, of the policy which has grown up over the last 15 years. Now, is comes back to coexistence is and détente, and what does this really mean in these contexts? And this is important to get this defined, I think. The, there have been many definitions of détente. 
It seems to me that the essence of the matter, the crux of the matter, is in establishing normal good neighborly relations, overcoming hostility, distrust, while preserving one's own views, one's own convictions. And in those conditions, we must live together. That is the meaning of détente as I see it. I think détente is alive, it's not dead, and in this context, I recall what Mr. Friedman said, that I keep speaking of the United States. No, we're thinking a great deal of Europe in this context, because it seems to us that Europe has by far not played its full role yet in this matter. It's up to you how to uh, translate that into deeds, but it seems to us that the policies, the potential of the European countries is much greater than what is being used now, and especially in the context of detente. But the logic of what you're saying is that you really need to be back into the talks. And I wonder whether you haven't trapped yourselves by your own rhetoric over the missile deployments in the past and got in a box for which you desperately need a way out as well as the rest of the world. And that what we're engaged in is simply finding ways out of this box because you, you clearly felt it necessary for reasons of legitimate security to uh, stress how important these missiles were to you. But that point has, has been made. Mr. Trelford, we are not driven ourselves into a box, but we will not tolerate being spoken to in the language of intimidation. As for our wish to negotiate, I've said that there is such a wish, but take this example. At Geneva, there are discussions now on chemical weapons. We have made supplementary proposals on the subject which concern on-site verification. Now we hear it being said from, our, from the Germans we spoke to recently and from Americans, and we're glad of this, that this is a, a something that makes possible progress in the talks. But let me stress that these are our proposals that made this possible. And secondly, that we have thereby shown our readiness to negotiate, but on an equal basis, without pressure, without blackmail. On such principles, we are prepared to discuss any problem, any problem. I don't think you possibly understand the extent to which we have felt in the West over the past five or six or seven years to be operating under the very same sense of intimidation that you describe yourself being put under now. I wonder, I mean, do you sense that there are things that the Soviet Union has said and done, uh, including the SS-20 missiles, over the past ten years that would have been better not done uh, and that have in fact contributed to uh, this unfortunate state of affairs, or do you put the blame wholly on malevolence from Washington? You know, the first thing I would like to say is, let us assume, yes, that you are disturbed and you are anxious about those missiles. Yes, that is logical, although there was no reason to be concerned. We have no intention of launching them as a first strike weapon or in general. These are defensive missiles, but let us leave that aside. All right, you had fears. I can understand that. But then why, when we proposed in 78, uh, a year before the two-track decision, we proposed discussing the problem. We repeated this in March 79, saying we are prepared to discuss intermediate-range missiles. Again, we repeated that in October 79, and we said that if there are no weapons, no new American weapons in Europe, we are prepared not just to discuss this problem, but to reduce our weapons. But there was no reply. Just no reply. But part of, part of the problem during that period was that the Soviet statements, uh, certainly until October 79, were all very vague. And also, of course, cruise missiles were being discussed already in the context of the strategic arms limitation force. No. No, no, no. When diplomats want to establish something, they ask questions. 
and we, we received no questions. But the, 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 these weapons were particularly mentioned in the protocol to the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Uh, the, the problem from the uh, Western European point of view uh, was that the Americans and the Russians seem to be discussing weapons that affected them, but not interested That's in weapons. That's exactly the second example I wanted to mention. Because you knew, when you took the Brussels decision, you knew that, that so three would provide for the discussion of those problems. But you ignored this, and you thereby uh, jeopardized the talks. The discussion said within that context. I think we have to conclude from this particular discussion that uh, if no errors are made on this in Soviet foreign policy or none are ever admitted. But I'd like to move on to the, to the general um, and ask him, is a nuclear war winnable in any sense? Answering your question, I would like to begin by saying that the Soviet Union considers the very idea of a nuclear war unacceptable. We feel that a war could be begun, but as for winning it, it's impossible. There cannot be a winner in this war. And in this connection, I would like to mention the conceptions often mentioned in the West about the possibility of conducting a limited local nuclear war, uh, about the possibility of conducting an all-out nuclear war. Speaking of a local nuclear war, they usually speak about the European theater as if for Europe it makes any difference, be it local or global. But to conduct a local nuclear war is impossible. He who understands these things knows this. It is impossible to conduct a local nuclear war. It'll be an all-out war. It'll evolve into an all-out war with fatal consequences. Um, I'd like to take advantage of these very special circumstances in which we have come all the way to Moscow and had the uh, opportunity, the rare chance, to meet a member of the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party and a member of the Soviet General Staff. And it's such a rare occasion, I feel that we ought to give you the opportunity of conveying any brief message that each of you in turn would like to give to the Western audience that is listening. Mr. Zagladin. It seems to me that from our conversation, a very interesting conversation in my view, three conclusions may be drawn. First, briefly, it seems to me it shows that we all must listen to one another better. We must learn to listen and understand each other. Secondly, we have to display patience. We have to be patient and follow up our discussions, let them be slow and pleasant, but we must follow them up and even negotiations that drag out are better than brief and dangerous conflicts. And third, it seems to me that our discussion shows that we can calmly discuss any problems proceeding on the assumption that we recognize our difference of ideologies, but guided by the consideration that we must bring about a turning point and must develop normal relations between all countries. That is our ardent wish, and I hope that such relations will develop. General. I would like to say that the Second World War ended 40 years ago. It cost civilization 50 million lives. When it ended, many people thought that this would be the last war. But time passed, and somebody must have forgotten this, and some must, must have been guided by other interests, began a new arms race.
I do not want to say that someone might start a war tomorrow, but the arms race is dangerous. The arms race can lead to a dead end from which there will be no way out. Therefore, the biggest wish, striving of the Soviet people, and that includes the military, yes, is to quicker stop the this mad arms race. Thank <laughs> you.